tonight on CBC Vancouver News. We felt that our lives were in danger. Uh, my eight month old was in the back seat. Engine failure, the recall that came too late for a BC family on a snowy highway also. Kudos, you know, we're heading in the right direction. New rules on life jackets after a deadly seaplane crash off Saturna Island and. If you guys don't back up, force will be used as necessary. Protests and politics at a BC Supreme Court hearing for Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. The engine fails and sometimes catches fire. For one Vancouver family, it happened on a snowy BC highway. The engine failed without warning. While it's too late for them, CBC's Go Public has learned the manufacturer of their vehicle is about to issue a recall. Here's Rosa Marcatelli. Ready? Ready. Danielle Collette cringes when she thinks about the moment her vehicle's engine failed at 120 kilometers an hour without warning on a snowy highway in BC. We felt that our lives were in danger. Um, my eight month old was in the back seat. Um, we were passing a semi trailer at the time. You know, we could have been seriously injured. What the couple didn't know at the time is Hyundai and its sister company Kia had already recalled millions of vehicles with the same or similar engines over fears a high-speed stall could cause a crash or the engines could burst into flames. The couple didn't know because their vehicle, a 2012 Hyundai Tucson, wasn't included in any of the recalls. I was quite surprised that they would only recall um, some of these engines. Safety watchdogs are blasting the car makers for taking too long to act. The recalls for what are called Theta 2 engines started almost four years ago. We're looking at some several millions of vehicles, both in the United States and Canada, that uh, we believe are at risk of catching on fire. 300 engine fires have been reported in the U.S. in less than a year. Transport Canada says three have been reported here. A mechanical inspection of the Vancouver couple's vehicle found the rod bearings had failed. The exact same issue identified in other vehicles that were covered in the recalls. But Hyundai told them they would have to pay the $8,000 cost of replacing the engine, more than the vehicle's worth. When the couple complained to Transport Canada, it told them it's investigating the recalls. I think part of the reason why Hyundai uh, dragged their feet was they didn't want to have to pay for all of those engines. Hyundai Canada responded to Go Public's specific questions with a general statement, saying it's working closely with Transport Canada to share information and to identify how to best ensure the safety of our customers as quickly as possible. Kia Canada also says it continues to work cooperatively with Transport Canada and will address any issues or findings as they arise. They need to come clean with their consumers, exactly you know, how risky is this? Do they have a solution? Hyundai just issued its latest recall involving these engines. More than 30,000 vehicles in Canada, 500,000 in the U.S. And I'm hoping that they take this seriously. It's unclear if the couple will be covered under the latest recall. But after Go Public contacted the dealership, the couple was told the cost of the engine repair would be covered no matter what. Rosa Marcatelli, CBC News, Calgary. Well, new safety measures for the float plane industry have finally been announced by the federal government. This follows a CBC News investigation in November, which revealed safety improvements recommended after a deadly crash off Saturna Island hadn't been implemented. As Eric Rankin reports, those touched by that 2009 tragedy say today's measures don't go far enough. Back in November, we wanted to know why Transport Minister Mark Garneau hadn't implemented long-delayed seaplane safety improvements. I, I would say to you that that's going to be soon, a matter of months. Today, Garneau and the industry regulator Transport Canada announced mandatory safety measures first recommended by investigators nine years ago following a tragic 2009 crash off of Saturna Island. All eight aboard survived impact, but six drowned including the wife and infant daughter of Patrick Morrissey. He's been pushing for change ever since. I'm happy to see that we're going in the right direction. Under the changes, everyone aboard smaller seaplanes with a maximum of nine passengers will be required to wear personal inflatable flotation devices. Operators will have to provide those PFDs within 18 months. And within three years, all pilots will need mandatory training on how to exit an aircraft underwater. 
But another key Transportation Safety Board recommendation that came out of the Saturna crash, the installation of pop-out windows, was not ordered by Transport Canada today. A big disappointment to Morrissey. If you can't get out, you can't use a life jacket. You need to get out first in order to use your life vest. So um, you have to do both. Bill Yearwood headed the TSB investigation into the Saturna crash. Now retired, he's able to speak out. He too says pop-out windows are sadly missing. That part is disappointing and I, I, I hope that there's still some consideration to, to move in that direction as we continue to lose lives from people drowning in aircraft. BC's seaplane industry isn't saying much about the safety changes it will have to implement. Harbour Air, one of the biggest float operators in the world, and Sea Air, which owned the plane that crashed off Saturna, say they're now reviewing the new requirements. Harbour Air adding passenger safety is its top priority. Eric Rankin, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, quite the spectacle at BC Supreme Court today as the CFO of Chinese telecom giant Huawei made an appearance. It's the first time Meng Wanzhou has been seen since Canada gave the go-ahead for her extradition hearing to the U.S. As Leon Young reports tonight, this is expected to be the start of a long legal process. Ready and smiling, Meng Wanzhou looked confident as she walked out of her west side home Wednesday morning, taking no issue with the throngs of cameras staked outside. As she pulled into BC Supreme Court, another crush of reporters. From Vancouver to China to Japan, each lining up more than an hour to get a shot of the woman at the center of a three-nation dispute. Come with me, please. With her private security detail close at hand, Meng finally makes her way into court. Her hearing was brief. Her lawyers gave a preview of some of the arguments they'll be making once her extradition hearing begins. Meng is accused of violating sanctions against Iran through a hidden subsidiary of Huawei. Her defense lawyer Richard Peck noted the political character of her case, saying comments by U.S. President Donald Trump suggesting Meng could be a bargaining chip in a trade war. He also cited concerns about her arrest at YBR in December, saying he will be filing applications alleging abuse of process. A civil suit has already been filed against the Canada Border Services Agency, the RCMP and the federal government, something this immigration lawyer says is a tactic in this legal battle. Civil process, the discovery process is an invaluable strategic tool because you get the treasure trove of high-level government documents on both sides of the border that can be used in the extradition case. Outside, supporters of Huawei were nowhere to be seen. They had made their way inside Meng's courtroom. Instead, protesters concerned about China's human rights record took a stand with an appeal to Justin Trudeau. Please, Prime Minister, please fo focus on these two Canadians and not us, not our free trade. Just forget about it. Michael Kovrig and Michael Spaver have been in Chinese custody since December, now accused of working together to steal state secrets. Experts say it's a game of tit-for-tat linked to Meng's case. While Beijing denies that fact, its interest in her case won't be going away anytime soon. Expect more of this when Meng returns to court May 8th. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. More charges have been laid against a man accused of stabbing a woman and a police officer outside a Delta Elementary School last month. Investigators say after taking Minoj George into custody, they began looking into what led up to the stabbing at Immaculate Conception School. All the new charges are in relation to the woman who was injured. She is still recovering in hospital. 49-year-old George is now also charged with attempted murder, sex assault with a weapon, extortion, unlawful confinement, choking to overcome resistance, and uttering threats. A man has also been arrested and charged in connection with 150 stolen wigs from a charity. 52-year-old Martin Way Gelt is now in custody. Way Gelt, considered one of the city's most prolific property offenders, was arrested today and remains in custody. Way Gelt has an extensive criminal past with more than 100 criminal convictions dating back to 1987. 
Each wig is valued at approximately $2,500, making the total stolen worth in excess of $350,000. The theft sparked outrage because many of the wigs were meant for kids with cancer. Each one was individually customized for each child going through cancer, and uh, we were hoping to get them back. They were ready to give, uh, you know, be worn right in time for school in September, and uh, that's when it happened, so they delayed going back to school, and it was quite heartbreaking. 66 of the wigs recovered from a downtown Eastside hotel are unusable due to contamination. The rest are still missing. Anyone with information is asked to contact the VPD or Crime Stoppers. An unusual incident this morning in Vancouver. The driver of this SUV apparently lost control of the vehicle, driving it right into a building on Victoria Drive. The collision peeling off part of the building's stucco exterior. Another car was also involved in the crash, which happened at about 11 this morning. The driver of the SUV has minor injuries. Uh, she was transported to hospital, and uh, uh, the injuries, like I said, were minor. The driver of the second vehicle is okay. As for how it all happened, well, that's still under investigation. Victoria Police are asking for help in solving a homicide case from two years ago. They want you to watch this newly released surveillance video showing the victim. Richard Blair Young went missing from his apartment in Victoria on February 8, 2017. Investigators say when this video was recorded, it was below zero degrees and there was heavy snow. In the video, Young is seen wearing a light jacket. We don't believe that this was... Um a purely random act, but it is not something where we believe that there's any reason for the public at large to be concerned. Police say Young's credit cards and his bank were charged more than $30,000 in fraudulent transactions on Vancouver Island and the Lower Mainland. Anyone with information on Blair's death is asked to contact the Victoria Police Department. Well, they are extremely fragile, protecting them a big challenge. But efforts now underway to preserve the so-called glass sponge reefs of the Howe Sound. As the CBC's Mickey Cowan tells us, it's a measure being supported by the local fishing industry. Scientists refer to glass sponge reefs as living dinosaurs, and their discovery in the Howe Sound, an ecological treasure amidst a trend of loss. We really have a crisis at a global level with wildlife and biodiversity. Over the last five decades, we've lost over 50% of the abundance and diversity of wildlife throughout the planet. The reefs were spotted in Pacific Northwest waters in the 1980s. Since then, organizations like the Canadian Marine Environment Protection Society have been exploring underwater and working to protect them. But like the name suggests, glass sponge reefs are extremely fragile, making preservation a challenge. They grow very slowly and also take a long time to recover once damaged, which makes them particularly vulnerable to certain kinds of fishing gear. To protect the reefs, the federal government is setting up marine refuges northwest of Vancouver. There will be eight of them protecting nine reefs from bottom contact fishing. Prawn and crab trapping, salmon trawling all put the reef at risk. The ban will block 3.5 square kilometers from recreational, commercial and indigenous fishers. And many fishers are okay with that. Respecting the science and understanding the role sponges play in the marine ecosystem, our members support these closures despite significant economic impacts the closures will have on individual prawn fishermen and their families. The news is welcome for many environmental advocates. For decades, pulp mills, mining and fishing significantly degrading the Howe Sound ecosystem. But fortunately, uh, we saw ways to mitigate many of those effects. And today, in the last 10 years particularly, we've seen the resurgence of life there. We've seen forage fish stocks, we've seen herring, and we've seen dolphins, and we've seen whales coming back to the Sound. We've had too many incidents within the Howe Sound and, uh, and all the Sailor Sea, but now there's going to be more accountability and responsibility, so that's awesome. Conservation officers will enforce the new closure areas starting this spring to help keep these reefs safe for years to come. Mickey Cowan, CBC News, Vancouver. Everyone knows I love a good snowfall. Yeah, you got your wish. Not really, though. Yeah. It was a <laughs> it very a blizzard. light dusting. <laughs>
So that means we bring in Johanna, <laughs> and you got to tell me why I didn't get more snow. <laughs> well, the answer is it's only just starting for the oh. south coast. I know, snowfall warnings in place. Not everyone is going to see snowfall accumulations, though. The snowfall warnings really just for the Tri-Cities, uh, Surrey, Langley, eastward out towards the valley, Abbotsford and Chilliwack, and only for five centimeters. It's a two to five centimeter event. I think Environment Canada are putting the warning out because it is yet another event across the south coast and the timing lining up that we could see this accumulation remain on the ground for the morning rush hour tomorrow. But notice how most of Metro Vancouver not actually under the warning. Doesn't mean we won't end up with maybe trace to one centimeter uh, through the overnight, but really seeing uh, the, the steadier snow starting to stick out towards the east. And I should mention the North Shore, just seeing some reports of that light uh, of the wet snow beginning to stick. Uh, through the next couple of hours though, heads up if you are in Maple Ridge, Langley, Surrey, eastward, uh, could be looking at a couple of slick centimeters that will stay on the ground through tomorrow morning. This is the low pressure system that's uh, sitting in the upper atmosphere, bringing cold air aloft, and that's what's bringing the snow. And it'll also bring a good setup for an interesting day tomorrow that'll include even more than rain, sun, and snow. I'll tell you more coming up. What? More than rain? Yes. <laughs> okay, yeah, I got I'm another looking one. forward to this. Thanks, <laughs> Johanna. You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Well, if you're just joining us, you can re-watch this newscast at any time. It's streaming live and on demand on our website, cbc.ca slash bc. Of course, you can also watch and join in on the conversation. You can ask questions on all of our stories. That's on Facebook and YouTube. Live and subscribe to our pages at CBC Vancouver. Coming up, his side of the story. What Justin Trudeau's former top advisor, Gerald Butts, says about the events that ended with the resignation of Jody Wilson-Raybould. Well, it is Wagstaff Wednesdays here on the mm -hmm. Facebook Live. Mm -hmm. So we're asking the question, are you prepared for an earthquake? Is your neighborhood prepared for an earthquake? Mm -hmm. Well, one group is dedicating itself to ensuring communities are ready for disasters. Tonight, Johanna introduces us to the team at Neighbor Lab. We've got Emmy Webb, Adele Terrius, Stephanie Koenig, and Leah Carlberg. Thank you for joining me today. Well, thanks for having us. Thanks. Let me start by asking you what Neighbor Lab is. So one example would be our resilience walks. A few months ago, we did a resilience walk with the city of Vancouver where we walked around the West End and we worked with people to talk about how uh, we might be vulnerable to disasters in that neighborhood, but also where the strengths are in the community. So and one of the components of Neighbor Lab is Neighbor Hub. Uh, can you tell me more about what that entails? Yeah, the Neighbor Hubs are shared pieces of community infrastructure. Each one offers resources that would be critical both on a day-to-day -day basis and also in the case of an emergency. These include energy, water, and means for communication, such as a one-way receiving radio and a community bulletin board. And we found that these pieces of public infrastructure would be really important because some city resources might be compromised in the case of an emergency. So we're working with um, a block of residents in Fairfield in Victoria and it's been a really iterative process. We're, we're involving the community in pretty much creating their own infrastructure to be placed on their block. Now it is going to be the form of a bench, but it incorporates other elements like a bulletin board for community members to share information about current events happening, um, but there's also solar panels that have um, outlets on the bench so people can come and charge their cell phones and it really acts as um, an educational tool. And then within that process, in the design process, they get the opportunity to meet their neighbors learn who's living on the block with them, learn who might be a little bit more vulnerable or might need help post-disaster, and then who has the skills and the resources to be able to help you know, rebuild the community post-disaster. Why do you think a physical structure is so important? Well, something really interesting that we discovered through our design process is that earthquakes are obviously very scary to talk about, mm -hmm but people were very interested in talking about physical infrastructure. So actually was able to break down boundaries of discussing earthquakes and talking about preparedness. And as we continued along this design process and talked about what kind of resources might be necessary, people were actually getting prepared for an earthquake by talking about physical infrastructure. 
Well, best of luck to your group. I'm looking forward to uh, watching future projects unfold. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Are you prepared for an earthquake? Um, I've got, well, I, I'm going to say sort of. We got the kit, but I think it's expired. Same here. Got to get a new one. Yeah. yeah. You got to keep up with that, otherwise yeah. everything yeah, kind of goes to waste. Sure. All right, we will be back in a few moments. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's longtime friend and former key advisor, Gerald Butts, has given his version of the SNC-Lavalin controversy. He denies he and others in government inappropriately pressured former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould to settle the case. I spoke with the former Attorney General once on this file, on December 5th, 2018. In three and a half years in government, we had one brief discussion about it. She raised it with me at the end of a two-hour dinner at the Chateau Laurier Hotel. She requested the meeting via text message a few days earlier. Butts claims it would be unfair to say he personally pressured Wilson-Raybould during that meeting. He says she requested it to discuss files other than SNC-Lavalin. Further, he says the former minister should have raised her concerns about inappropriate pressure with the prime minister directly. But says he only found out when Wilson Raybould testified last week. Now, after Butt's testimony today, a motion to call back Jody Wilson Raybould was voted down by the Liberal majority on the Justice Committee. The opposition is criticizing that. This committee has voted against allowing her to come back to committee and to provide her testimony again shows very clearly that this is a biased process, that the committee is attempting to avoid getting to the heart of this matter. They're afraid of Ms. Wilson-Raybould coming back because she's going to prove everything that Mr. Butt said was wrong. One of them isn't telling the full story and we need to find out which one it is. And the only way to do that is by bringing back Jody Wilson-Raybould and putting Mr. Butts' testimony to her and let's see what she has. And Gerald Butts was the first of three people to appear before the Justice Committee today. Deputy Justice Minister Natalie Duray also testified, along with the clerk of the Privy Council, Michael Wernick, his second time before the committee. He was not responding, he was responding rather, not only to accusations that he threatened the former Attorney General. But also to allegations of partisanship supporting interference in the SNC-Lavalin case. He denies both. I did not threaten the Attorney General. But in you don't any remember. Way. You told us you don't I remember. I am telling you, you aware, now, so Mr. Angus, if you, you don't will remember. If you want the answer. Finish the answer to the question. Mr. 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 Clark. I have never raised partisan considerations. I reminded her repeatedly she was the final decision maker. I did not attempt to influence her decision. I was giving her relevant context about public interest considerations. I did not suggest any consequences for her. I made no threats to the former Attorney General. Now, Jody Wilson-Raybould is responding today, saying she is willing to reappear before the Justice Committee. She says her testimony last week was only a detailed summary, not a complete account. She says the order lifting confidentiality only covered her time as Attorney General and that she's not allowed to reveal anything that happened during her time as Minister of Veterans Affairs. Wilson-Raybould adds, quote, if that should ever change, feel free to reach out. Now, as one key player in all of this, we haven't heard from today, the Prime Minister himself. Yes, Justin Trudeau reportedly spent the day in his office strategizing, but he is expected to speak tomorrow morning. CBC will be streaming that on all major platforms once he is live. With all the controversy around the CFO of Chinese tech giant Huawei, the company says it's being unfairly targeted. CBC goes inside its headquarters next.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. We felt that our lives were in danger. Um, my eight-month-old was in the back seat. Um, we were passing a semi-trailer at the time. You know, we could have been seriously injured. Engine failure on a snowy BC highway. A recall issued by Hyundai coming far too late for one family. The car maker tells the CBC more engine recalls are coming soon to Canada. The concern is they can overheat and burst into flames. Those are still critical as part of the, the accident path. Wearing life jackets will soon be mandatory on some float planes. The new rules follow an investigation into the 2009 crash off Saturna Island that killed six people. Critics say this is a step in the right direction, but more needs to be done, including pop-out windows and intuitive door handles. If you guys don't back up, force will be used as necessary. Quite the spectacle at BC Supreme Court in Vancouver as Chinese telecom executive Meng Wanzhou made a brief appearance. The Justice Department has given the go-ahead to proceed with her extradition hearing to the United States. Well, the arrest of its CFO and other controversies have made Huawei a household name right around the world, but it's not the kind of recognition the tech giant wants. Huawei says it is being unfairly targeted. The CBC's Sasha Petrosik goes inside the company. Huawei's headquarters, its campus here in Shenzhen, has become the center of the storm. It's facing a controversy. It says it never expected legal and political challenges and accusations, it says, are simply unfounded. We will have you over here. Catherine Chen is Huawei's senior vice president, sitting down for an interview at CBC's request. She says she's surprised at the U.S. campaign to keep Huawei's advanced 5G internet technology out of global networks. So why are they so afraid of you? <laughs> I really have no idea why a government as big as the U.S. would be afraid of a small company like Huawei, she says. Why can't there be Chinese companies with great technology? One U.S. fear has been that somewhere here in Huawei's normally secretive production lines, it is building back doors to allow the Chinese government to snoop and that Chinese law requires Huawei to pass along foreign data. Not so, says Chen. We give you our pledge, she says, from our founder down to every employee, that we will refuse any request from any government to install back doors or collect information. Chen is a close friend of Meng Wanzhou. When she was arrested, were you surprised? Oh, I was very surprised. I was shocked and heartbroken, she says, in a sometimes emotional answer. Chen says she's been speaking to Meng Wanzhou since the arrest. She says she admires and shares Meng's optimism. We believe the actions taken by the U.S. are an abuse, she says. But Huawei believes even more that the Canadian justice system can make a just, fair and transparent decision. That hasn't been the position of the Chinese government, which calls the Canadian process unfair and political in the case of Hmong and Huawei. So now Huawei is pulling out all the stops, embarking on a PR offensive around the world to try to convince citizens, consumers and their governments that it is not a threat. In the meantime, this campus's 18,000 employees are going for lunch. Sasha Petrosek, CBC News, Shenzhen, China. And at uh, 631 on this Wednesday evening, here's a live look at downtown Vancouver tonight. Snowfall warning is up. Johanna Wagstaff will have more on that in her forecast next.
This weather update is brought to you by Remax. What's your home worth? Find out with our instant valuation tool at Remax.ca. This is outrageous. What is the date today? This it is outrageous. <laughs> I'm with you. We're in March. Snowfall <laughs> warning. Snowfall warning. Wow. Yeah, it's pretty late in the season. I mean, that's not to say we haven't had snow this late before. If you're wondering, I think it's mid-April is our latest snow date ever on I record. I remember that. I'm hoping we don't get to that. <laughs> but yeah, let's get through this latest round of snow, starting with the time lapse, because this morning was a clear one. Uh, you can see the clouds rolling in from the east. Uh, that's with the system that is sort of sliding up from the south. So we've got that counterclockwise flow overcast by the afternoon, wet snow and rain by the evening and we're going to start to see things sticking in the next couple of hours. Snowfall warnings in place as I mentioned earlier though it is just eastern sections of Metro Vancouver Tri-Cities uh, out towards Maple Ridge and then the valley. That's where we're looking at that two to five centimeter accumulation. There is a slight chance we'll see some trace amounts across Metro Vancouver but if I uh, pause you on the radar right now you can really see just getting some of the steadier snow showing up on the radar anyway. Uh, Maple Ridge down towards uh, uh, even North Burnaby and parts of uh, the drive actually reporting some wet snowflakes and the North Shore seeing some sticking right now. But again, really east uh, out towards the valleys where we've got the uh, steadier stuff. Taking you through the overnight, you can see we start to see that taper off through to tomorrow morning, uh, stopping you at Thursday 7 a.m. Things really do taper off, but we're still looking at pockets of wet snow and then as temperatures warm up, those pockets of wet snow will change over to pockets of rain. Here's 5 p.m. Thursday. There's a lot going on. Hard to capture exactly what will be where because this is a bit of a convective setup. The center of that upper level low will be right over top of the south coast spinning. And whenever we have colder air, on top of warmer air below, recipe for thunderstorms. So I'm not ruling out uh, some isolated hail and thunder and lightning, particularly over the strait. I think a better chance along the island and the North Shore, but just heads up, uh, we could be getting some hail tomorrow afternoon along with the wet snow, rain and sunny break. So everything but the kitchen sink for your Thursday, uh, right through to Friday, lingering moisture in the air, but definitely a clearing trend as we get closer to the weekend. So zero overnight, back up to a six tomorrow afternoon. It's a chillier Thursday uh, than the past couple of days we've been seeing, but I do think we'll get some sunny breaks uh, by the afternoon hours. Okay, snowfall totals. This is a rapid update model I'm showing you. So already seeing changes uh, from just an hour ago. Uh, looking at Metro Vancouver, most of Metro Vancouver not looking at major accumulations. But you can see the white areas towards the North Shore, downtown Vancouver, Tri-Cities. That's where we're looking at trace amounts north of uh, Highway 1 out towards the valley two to five centimeters. That's where the snowfall warning is in place. It's a short event, but again, heads up, you might wanna leave a little extra time for travel tomorrow morning. There's that upper level low, bringing some snow to the Rockies. Uh, it does dissipate and we've got high pressure moving back in and our long range is gonna look a little something like this. So a couple of cooler days, cooler unsettled days. I didn't put the lightning strikes in a YVR forecast, but Victoria, uh, definitely towards the straight, a chance there. And then as we head into the weekend, that's a little more spring-like. I put the double digits back in for you, Anita. Well, a little more it. confidence today. I noticed. Yes, yeah. that was that was for you, but I do stand by that. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Yep. <laughs> uh, despite our, what is it, seven or eight rounds of snow in the last little while? Eight, it has eight, yeah. It's been too bad. The same can't be said, though, for the rest of the country. Icy, winter, terrible weather. Mm -hmm. It's true, and in Cape Breton, that has led to a spectacular frozen natural attraction. A huge ice wall along the shore of a popular local lake. The CBC's Gary Mansfield stopped by for a look at the frosty phenomenon. High winds and storm surge has created a huge wall of ice along the coastline of Irish Vale. Big giant ice cubes. It's impressive. It's hard to believe that, I mean, the force of the waves that would have pushed these pieces of, uh, of ice are not little pieces. The Bador Institute estimates the ice wall to be four to six meters high, four to five meters wide, and 700 meters long. That's about 16,000 tons of ice. Welcome to Canada. <laughs> Paul Trinidad is with a group of friends from the Philippines. They say the ice wall is selfie heaven. This is uh, really nice and it's relaxing when you look at them. It's really fantastic and amazing. <laughs> 
On top, it's windy, as huge pieces of ice are stacked together like giant Lego blocks. It's pretty cool, yeah. Quite the view up here. Yeah, it's really nice. Nicole Latimer is one of many who took the risk and ventured to the top. That's a lot of ice. <laughs> it's quite a bit, and a little too big for my glass. <laughs> as the ice builds up, the wall continues to grow. So does the traffic along the road as people stop to catch a glimpse. Oh, it's beautiful. I mean, it shows what nature can do and what the lakes can do. Adds a whole perspective to it. I I've seen this before. Um, sometimes it's spectacular and sometimes it's just a little bit. The Bador Institute says over the last 15 years, there's been three similar ice walls on the Bador Lake, but this one is getting a lot of attention on social media because it's visible from the road. Ice, ice, baby. Gary Mansfield, CBC News. Irish Vale. I mean, I'd be singing that too. I know. A little ice, ice baby. We're going to need a <laughs> night's watch for that wall. <laughs> huh? oh, oh. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> All right, that's it for the weather. <laughs> As Vancouver's measles outbreak starts to dial down, Toronto seeing its first confirmed case this year. How the baby got the virus after the break. I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. If you've ever wondered what it's like behind the scenes here at CBC Vancouver, here's your chance. Go online and book a date to come in for a tour of our integrated newsroom. And our home can be your home. From concerts to galas to bar mitzvahs, our studio space can be transformed for any occasion and is available for rent. For more from CBC Vancouver, check us out online at cbc.ca slash bc. The city of Toronto has its first confirmed case of the measles this year. It involves an unvaccinated baby who contracted the virus while on an overseas trip with family. But with March break just around the corner, many more families will be traveling and potentially exposed to measles. Kelda Yoon has more on how to keep your little ones protected.
Dr. Vanita Dubey from Toronto Public Health says measles begins like a cold. A runny nose, not feeling well, you can get a fever, red eyes, and then it's the classic telltale red rash. She says the infant that contracted the city's first confirmed case is now resting at home and risk to the public is low. The child did not go to a lot of places where they could have exposed people here in Toronto. Nonetheless, this is raising concern about parents who are not vaccinating their children. But in this case, the child was under one year old and... Typically, the MMR vaccine is given at one year of age. So should parents be worried? With March break just around the corner, many families are planning on traveling. So what do they need to know to protect their little ones and themselves? We're here to speak with Dr. Iris Gorfinkel to find out. Hello. If they know they're going to be traveling, there's no real harm to getting the vaccination. The only thing about it is, is that Toronto Public Health may not recognize it if it's given too early. So Toronto Public Health likes to see it right at 12 months. But Toronto Public Health says it's aware travel changes things and that six months of age is acceptable and will be recognized. If they're traveling with a young infant in particular, consider getting the vaccine early. Gorfinkel says doing travel research is also important. But understand that it's not like measles is rampant everywhere in the world. There are hot spots of diseases. So in the Philippines and certain areas within Africa right now, those are the key hot spots right now. She also urges parents to make sure they are immunized, particularly mothers who breastfeed. For breastfed infants, the immunity goes through the breast milk helping the infant. Finally, those born between 1970 and 1992 may have had only one booster. Another dose is recommended for immunity. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. Iconic game show host Alex Trebek is battling stage four pancreatic cancer. He made the announcement himself earlier today in a video shared online. Now, normally the prognosis for this is not very encouraging, but I'm going to fight this and I'm going to keep working and with the love and support of my family and friends and with the help of your prayers also, I plan to beat the low survival rate statistics for this disease. Truth told, I have to because under the terms of my contract, I have to host Jeopardy for three more years. So help me keep the faith and we'll win. Trebek has hosted Jeopardy! since 1984, totaling more than 7,000 episodes of the show. He's won countless awards, received a Lifetime Achievement Emmy in 2011, and was named to the Order of Canada in 2017. The federal government has put out an interim report on the creation of a national pharmacare program. Canadians should not have to choose between paying for prescriptions and putting food on their table. The report recommends a national drug agency to oversee pharmacare, a national list to harmonize what drugs will be covered, and investing in information technology. There's no price tag for the plan yet. However, the Parliamentary Budget Officer has estimated a broad coverage program would cost $20 billion a year. The final report is expected in the spring. Ottawa also unveiled its much-anticipated space program today in Edmonton. As Rafi Bujikanian reports, it includes hundreds of millions of dollars in investments for small businesses and for young minds to take their own small steps towards space exploration. This is one of the more expensive recent commercial space endeavors. Canada's newly unveiled space strategy is supposed to help smaller businesses get in on the action too. Ottawa says it's kicking in $150 million for smaller companies to be able to develop jobs and new endeavors in the space sector. So it's open to all small businesses. And, and the way this works is this $150 million, there's going to be proposals that will be set out to allow companies to look at the different options of developing technologies. We'll help them with the proof of concept, the prototyping. So it's really designed with where the innovation occurs, and that occurs in Edmonton, it can occur anywhere across the country, and it's specifically targeted at small businesses. 
The federal government has already unveiled the centerpiece of its space strategy, Canada's participation into NASA's Lunar Gateway program, as well as more than $2 billion for the aerospace industry over the course of more than two decades. Today, Ottawa also announced its plans for developing children's interest in space. It's launching a new online program to help students learn about space. It's also developing a contest. The winners get to go train at Canada Space Agency Centre in Quebec. When I talk to my colleagues who've been to space, it's very clear that the perspective of leaving our planet and looking back upon it changes you. Uh, fundamentally changes your perspective and we work together in space and when we look back around the, upon the planet we realize we need to work together on this planet better. We need to keep striving for excellence in our partnerships and uh, I think space is going to be inspiration for that for humanity. The aerospace industry sector is welcoming today's announcement which has been long in the waiting. Ottawa was first supposed to announce it five years ago. The sector says it does want to see a more detailed costed plan. Ottawa says that should be coming in the next few months. Rafi Bujikani on CBC News, Edmonton. Well, a defunct record store once considered an international institution is on the verge of getting another spin. CBC's Diane Buckner now on the Canadian entrepreneur who hopes to save HMV. It's been here since 1921, the original HMV store in London's Oxford Circus. Record stores have had that day, unfortunately. When I was younger, I used to come in here every week. I used to love it. HMV declared bankruptcy in the UK last December. Who would have thought that the record store where the Beatles recorded their demo would go out of business? Now the chain may have new life, thanks to a Canadian that British papers are calling a saviour who will rescue the company. But don't tell him that. Honestly, I find it flattering. I'm starting to blush. Right? In I Hamilton, Ontario, this is the so-called saviour, Doug Putman, a 34-year-old business school dropout. You know, I just keep saying I feel lucky that we were able to do it. Because our customer really likes to actually leaf through it. We're in one of the 85 stores Putman owns in Canada, the Sunrise Records chain. It was HMV Canada until 2017, when that part of the chain went bankrupt. Putman bought it, rebranded every location as Sunrise, and started turning a profit. We know we did it in Canada. We know we're going to do it in the UK. So this is just our toy distribution warehouse. He'll need all his business know-how, which he developed here at his family's toy distribution company. My parents started it uh, 25 years ago, so uh, my dad was a steel worker at Stelco for many years and uh, remortgaged his house with my mom and took $50,000 and said, let's try it. Customers throughout. He started running the company at age 23 and expanded the operation. The music business, though, presents a special type of challenge. How's it going? In London, at HMV head office, Putman is starting to work with product managers. I mean, it doesn't seem like we get much supplier support. There's not a level playing field at the moment. The challenges are the digital window, which has been there a while now. A hundred stores in the UK will keep the HMV name, but switch to his Sunrise formula. More music-related merchandise, vinyl showcased at the front of the store, wider selection. We've got 1,600 people that work for us that rely on us to get that paycheck every week, and we can't fail. We have to deliver. He has a lot of work to do to earn his savior status. Diane Buckner, CBC News, Hamilton, Ontario. There's still vinyl out there. Mm -hmm, still apparently. there. Yes. Well, in Metro Vancouver, uh, parents rarely have to worry about letting kids play outside in the winter, but for other parts of the country, extreme cold forces many to stay inside. But Molly Allen is catching up with some young Regina students who aren't being stopped by one of the most frigid seasons in almost a century. For weeks, there have been extreme cold warnings in Saskatchewan with temperatures dipping into the minus 40s and wind chills that could freeze exposed skin within minutes. But while the rest of us hid inside and moaned about it, these little troopers went outside every day. Good morning, dear Earth. The kindergarten class at Prairie Sky School in Regina starts each morning around a cozy fire. Then it's outside for at least an hour to learn and play. Going on a nature walk to see what we can see. Today they're getting a science lesson on magnets. See what else our, our magnets will stick to. 
The benefits of outdoor learning are well known, but in Saskatchewan, in the winter, it's challenging. In February, there were 23 days when it was at least minus 25 with wind chill. That's the cutoff when most schools in Saskatchewan don't send their kids outside. Teacher Anna Rose says her students used to be trapped inside, but... We went crazy and, and, they, and then, then they got soft and they sort of forgot how to be outside and so even when it was minus 20 they were crying and they were cold. So what you're saying is don't get soft. I, I think we do get soft. I think you know I, I, I think that uh, making it part of our daily routine really helps the kids come to school dressed and prepared to be outside. Wear a heavy jacket, we wear layers and a took and a scarf. The lesson here, don't escape the cold, embrace it. What's your favorite thing to do outside? Play. Do you have to run around more? Oh, off she goes. No time to talk. The forecast suggests March and April will be colder than normal, but the deep freeze is coming to an end, so perhaps all of us can get outside a bit more. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Regina. Other well, movements are a mystery. Coming up, how scientists are learning more about an elusive giant off the coast of Nova Scotia. Scientists are learning more about the presence of an elusive giant off the coast of Nova Scotia. The blue whale is the world's largest and loudest animal. Their call can be heard over 100 kilometers away, but they're hard to find and their movements are still a bit of a mystery. But now, as Paul Withers explains, underwater recorders are revealing the secrets of blue whales living off Canada's east coast. It's humongous! The sight of a 25-meter blue whale surfacing is as impressive as it is rare. Wow. This one was photographed off Nova Scotia by researcher Hillary Moores like, Murphy. This guy surfaced maybe 20 or 30 meters right in front of the boat. This right now, this is a map. The DFO scientist is lead author of a new study on the distribution of blue whales in Atlantic Canada. Blue whales are using our waters off Nova Scotia more than I expected them to. It's believed just a few hundred individuals make up the North Atlantic population, and it's a big, big ocean. Now technology is making it easier to find them. And it's devices like this made by JASCO and Dartmouth that are allowing scientists to hear 
what they cannot see. Underwater recorders near the ocean floor are listening year round. The recorders are lowered to the ocean floor, in many cases in deep water. They capture the calls of whales and can distinguish between species. This is the booming low frequency call of a blue whale. The recording has been sped up. The use of the technology is really important because it has revealed new information on whale occurrence in Canadian waters throughout the year. So in the case of blue whales, uh, we did think that most of the individuals migrated down south during the winter, but the acoustics have revealed that at least some individuals are remaining in our water throughout the year. The study says the most important habitats are likely in deep water off the continental slope of the Scotian Shelf, deep water off the Grand Banks, and the Laurentian Channel between Cape Breton and Newfoundland. So now we have a far better idea of... Um, how the whales are using these areas throughout the year. Still, it will likely be many years before an accurate count of their numbers can be made. In the meantime, scientists will be listening in from recorders from the Bay of Fundy to far offshore, right into the Gulf of St. Lawrence. Paul Withers, CBC News, Halifax. Very cool. Mm -hmm. oh. Technology and nature, mm -hmm. my favorite. Okay, we've got more nature. A wildlife rehabilitation center just outside Winnipeg is asking for some out-of-the-ordinary donations. Staff say they need used mascara brushes, especially heading into the spring. We've also cleaned off small insects that have been stuck inside the feathers. The Prairie Wildlife Rehabilitation Center uses them to clean <laughs> baby animals, brushing away furs and fleas. Aww, the Brushes can be used on owls, but also songbirds, bunnies, and squirrels. Oh, man. Uh, anybody looking to help the cause, though, is asked to clean old mascara off the brush before donating. Oh, those eyes. I know. Oh, I'm a sucker. You love birds. I yeah, do. that's and true. Those, those <laughs> eyes are just like staring. Oh, <laughs> love them. Uh, and that's it for our program tonight. Dan Burrett is here at 11 o'clock after the National. Good night. Good night.